All is not quite well mm. in Kenya. No, it isn't. Across the Horn of Africa as well, but let's focus on Kenya because the ongoing drought has been with us for how long now? At least four years of failed or insufficient rain. Yes. And what we're seeing in various parts of the country, almost half the geographical landmass of this country is drought. Mm. Many counties and many people in those counties are facing drought. And drought here, we're talking about no rain, so therefore no food, no water, uh, no water and uh, pasture for their livestock. Livestock dying, stories are emerging out of, you know, uh, these counties around, even the counties around Nairobi, Na Kajiado, into Mach Machakos, some parts of Machakos, into some parts of Makwen, into Kitui, and then you stretch further into the coastal counties, into the northeastern counties, and what's happening, it's really, really, really bad. And people have just been talking about how can we help our brothers and sisters in the country to live with the situation that we have, to be able to um, survive another day. That is having a meal. That's having some water, you know, sent to them. Um, how can we support them if it's livestock off-taking program? This has been rolled out by the government a number of uh, times now we've heard about it. Are we actually seeing the benefits of this reaching the farmers? When you see animal being taken to the market, emaciated cows, emaciated uh, sheep and goats, and people are just saying, just give me a hundred bob and take the goat. Give me 500 bob and take a cow. A cow that would ordinarily sell for 50,000 shillings. They're willing to take 500 bob. And they want you to take it fast before it collapses and then the value just disappears. You know, people talk of the stock exchange and the crashing of the stock exchange. Mm. When you look at this drought situation, this is our equivalent. Because the stocks that very many Kenyans have is in livestock. Yeah. The stock that they have, the, co the, the, the this tradable commodity is perhaps what they have in their farms. Now, yeah. if because of drought, animals are dying, because of drought, nothing grows, it's a crash. And the, when the value drops to the point where it's pittance, then that thing, for, if we're crashing, it has collapsed. Yeah. Yes. But the thing is, it isn't new. It's not as though this is a problem that we are encountering for the first time since the 21st century. No, it, it happens very, very often. It's the happened before. It, keep ha it, it keeps sometimes, it's, it's cyclical. On a yearly basis, there'll be this problem or the other. The only problem with this particular season we are in is not only the length of time we've had this problem, but just how far reaching it is. Mm. And the consequences are dire. It's even worse because we keep, we have a growing population. So the numbers of people who actually need to be assisted. And now that's before you throw in the vagaries of climate change, you throw in the vagaries of COVID, mm. you throw in all these things that are happening at the same time. So the situation, uh, we are, we're not just in dire straits, we, yeah. are, we are in very desperate straits. We are, yes. we are indeed. The Secretary General of the Kenya Red Cross Society has arrived. She's in the studio, Dr. Asha Mohammed. Good morning. Morning. Welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for Welcome to me. the hot seat of the Situation Room. <laughs> Doesn't uh, feel hot. Ah, <laughs> very good. Good, good, it's good. Never good, intended good, good, to feel hot. <laughs> never really intended. Just me meant to make you feel comfortable. Yes, yeah, sure. Dr. Mohammed, there's a lot of work that the Kenya Red Cross Society does. Um, and it has done in the past mm. when we faced similar situations. Now, let me just give a bit of a background. So last year, the president declared the ongoing drought situation a national disaster mm. um, after the advice from the Drought Management Authority, after meeting with the leadership from these regions. And he said, let's mobilize resources so that we can help our people. At the point, the figure was being bandied around were about 6 billion shillings and the government had set, can set aside 2 billion shillings in the beginning and then we can look for the other 4 billion shillings. Recently, this figure has moved up. To, uh, I think it's uh, close to 8 to 10 billion shillings. Mm. You have a new patron and this is the new president of the mm. Republic uh, whom you installed yesterday at State House. What is the current figure in government circles that's required to address the ongoing situation? 
Um, thank you, f uh, first of all, for having me. I think, uh, of course, I cannot speak for government, uh, <laughs> but you had the, the president uh, and also the deputy president, I think, in the last few days, um, uh, talking about, uh, I think there was now the project projection of uh, 10 billion uh, is the figure that... Uh, uh, government, uh, you know, was putting out. But I also want to say that um, we should not also be stuck on the current figure or the, the, the number that is given today or maybe in a week's time. Why am I saying this? Because this uh, current drought situation is very, uh, shall I say, unpredictable in the way it is unfolding. Uh, and I just want to go back from last year when um, the former president declared it a national disaster and that was in September. We were talking about 2.8 million Kenyans uh, being affected by the drought. Mm. Today, just uh, about a year later, we are saying we have 4.35 million Kenyans that are needing assistance. Mm. So even as the Kenya Red Cross Society, we put out an appeal through our international Red Cross system uh, to be able to support, um, you know, some of the people at that particular point in time. But uh, as time went by, uh, that figure did not make sense anymore because the numbers continued to increase. Yeah. And you can see between uh, 2.8, 4.35 within a year already, the, 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 the number of people that are falling into this bracket. You have also seen uh, how some of the counties that um, traditionally would not actually be considered as you know, country, uh, counties that can be affected by drought are now falling into this bracket. Mm. You know, the Meru's, uh, Taraka uh, you know, all these kind of, of, of counties. Mm. Uh, and so for me, uh, I think it is the kind of um, figure that you will have to keep adjusting. Adjusting on a daily basis. Exactly. And also, as we get to know more about what are some of the very, very uh, uh, deep uh, issues that are affecting these communities. Um, you saw, uh, you know, just two days ago when uh, Citizen also aired uh, uh, this uh, piece from Turkana. Mm. And I think uh, Kenyans were shocked that, you know, how is it that we are now seeing these kind of images? And my, my issue really is how do we then also ensure that we get to every corner of this country to really understand what is going on. Because unfortunately, uh, yes, we must use a system and use a standard. And so we, 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 we follow the classification that is a global uh, standard that is used to classify and say, this county is in alarm, mm. this is in alert, this is, I don't know. But within those same counties, mm. sometimes actually you find you have, you know, pockets that are really, really bad. And if you're not careful, then you could easily ignore that county. And yet then there are people who are actually going to get to the situation that we saw. Yeah. I give an example, Marsabit, a few months back, uh, we had, you know, a place called Illerate where the malnutrition rate uh, there was 53%. 53%. The global uh, average that is given as already the point where you now say this is bad is 15%. <laughs> and Illerate was at 53%. Mm. But this is just a pocket within Massive the whole the county. Entire county. So I think for me, this is really how I like to see this whole issue about the resourcing mm. and therefore uh, looking at it as a moving target uh, based on, because now we are dealing with different uh, phases, I would say. We are now in an emergency phase, so we are dealing with immediate needs. Mm. But we also have to start looking at the mid to long term because I think this is where the challenge is that we are putting all the resources, of course, to the immediate because we have to save lives. But in so doing, we are also not uh, being careful about putting in measures that will ensure that as people come out of that emergency phase, mm. they have things that can help them now to sort of to normalize. Uh, let's go sequentially. Yeah. All right. So let's start with the emergency. Yes. Because today people are in this particular situation. Yeah. And the numbers have risen by over 2 million in just 12 months. Yes. And they are going to rise. You've talked about just how the information arrives at the national level so that that informs the kind of response 
that various areas receive. Yeah. How is that information passed on upwards? I'm imagining a government that has presence at the lowest level, at village level. There's a village headman, there's a chief, goes all the way to a regional commissioner, goes all the way to the CS coordinating national government. I'm imagining then other agencies working, such as yourselves. Kenya Red Cross has presence across the country. There are mm -hmm. other humanitarian agencies across the country. Is there a coordinating mechanism that is focused specifically to what's happening in the country today, where there's a dashboard that shows you this, if I zoom in to Ilrit, I'll be able to pick out the high levels of malnutrition? I would say we have, uh, shall I say, multiple systems uh, that, you know, are used to actually get this information. Because, for example, you have the uh, health facilities where then you can get the records in terms of, you know, malnutrition. Uh, but most of the times then it would maybe be only for those children that have come through the system. So how about those that don't come through the system? You have, of course, the county that has its own uh, structure all the way to the ward. You have the national government that has its structure. Then you have, of course, uh, national organizations and community-based organizations that are also running, you know, other uh, systems. Uh, but we have at the county level the county steering group which then com is supposed to comprise both the national government, county government, and other partners like ourselves, mm. where now everything gets uh, sort of consolidated. I think for me the challenge really is how all this is coordinated and how all that is brought together mm. to ensure that the picture that then is being uh, presented and being used as the, you can say, the, the, the basis of even the different interventions is, is a full picture. And I think this is really something that uh, uh, I would say we are now uh, having a very, um, shall I say, a concerted um, uh, strong effort by the, the, the government. Uh, even as late as yesterday and even today, we are going back into some meetings where we are all there. Are you happy, including, Dr. Mohammed? Including private sector is there. Dr. Mohammed. Yes. Are you happy with the level of... You've talked about the importance of coordination of these yes. counties to area yes. groups. Yes. Are you happy with the level of coordination that is currently uh, being witnessed? It is varied. Some counties are doing better than others. And this is where also there is a problem. And this is this is a discussion that has been held very openly also with government. And uh, uh, to say that we need to ensure that the capacity of these structures especially at the county level where, you know, that business actually happens, has to be uh, beefed up and it has to be enhanced and they need to also have the necessary tools to be able to do this. One of the things we have done as Kenya Red Cross uh, through some support of uh, some of our partners, we are supporting some counties to set up their own emergency operation centers because we have that experience and we have it at national level where we are even able to monitor and to pick up uh, emergencies uh, happening uh, in the country. And uh, this is one way I believe uh, counties need to go to, to ensure that they can be able to pick as much information, like you're saying, uh, today if I'm in my office, I can, through our emergency operations center, we have cameras and we can zoom in and we can tell you there's an accident on Mombasa Road at Point Flan, yeah. and you send an ambulance to go and respond. And mm -hmm. that's why we can be as fast as we can. But if we don't have such systems all over the country to be able to pick you know, those uh, occurrences as they, as they happen and be able to use that data to actually inform our decisions, then a lot of it will be either from very old data, because by the time you wait for data to come from the lowest point and then you start to react, the situation could easily have changed because that is the, 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 the place we find ourselves. This business that uh, the Red Cross is known for <coughs> is a business they've been in for a long time. Yes, and they're in this business globally. Yes. So it means, by and large, you could argue that the Red Cross are fairly well informed and they know exactly which side you should turn your head, which direction you should look at when it comes to these issues. Mm -hmm. But now, how well are you listened to when you come up with solutions that don't just take care of the emergency, but look to the future? Because you have this large store of knowledge. You have this large store of data. You know. You've understood it. You've dealt with it. How well are you listened to? <laughs> 
That's uh, an, an interesting question. I would say uh, I think the Red Cross has been seen as an authority in terms of uh, disaster risk management in this country, and that is why today uh, – we can sit at the level we sit in with government, with the UN, with other stakeholders, because that is how how we have been placed mm. in terms of having this knowledge and experience. I think the challenge for me is really about how we act on the information that is given. For example, uh, with this drought, it's not even the Red Cross. We have the meteorological department, we have our climate scientists very early on, in 2021, they started to put out information, started to put out data to say, uh, looks like we are going into a bad situation. Looks like the rains are going to start falling. And as the Red Cross, we also started to talk about it in the country, but also with our international partners to say there is a situation here that is unfolding. And one of the things we are really encouraging these days is to st what we call anticipatory action, is that if we have the data, we have the science that something like this is going to happen, yeah. we should be able to put resources up front to mitigate yeah. so that we don't end up uh, seeing the kind of images that we, that we are seeing. But with that then, the question then is, where is the resources to be able to act? Where are the frameworks that allow us to be able to put money up front to deal with these issues? And uh, again, if I talk about the Red Cross system, for us, because of this experience and all that, uh, internationally now we even have um, an emergency fund uh, which looks at anticipatory action. So, for example, for Kenya Red Cross, we actually got some funding from our international uh, Red Cross um, uh, secretariat to say, okay, this is an advanced uh, support for you to look at what are some of those critical measures that you need to. So information can be given, like you, like you ask, yes. People listen, yes. But now, those that need to act where they are, then may not necessarily take it up or may not necessarily take it as urgently as it's needed or maybe the resources to do that is not there. When you look at drought patterns in this country, yeah. what is consistent is that the areas that seem to be affected most are areas that we often refer to as areas that have been marginalized in the mm. past. Mm. They're remote. But this current situation is unique in the sense that areas that previously didn't have that sort of problem or are not associated have now been roped in, mm. which means it's escalating beyond the normal boundaries. Mm -hmm. Now, it's cyclical. It'll happen again. Agriculture, which we say is the mainstay of what, three quarters of the population in this country, is what is most threatened by what we actually have. And when that is threatened, then I think it's not difficult to extrapolate what, how, how that uh, comes into being. Now, Red Cross, beyond just the humanitarian aid, have also been known to have a business sense mm -hmm. and understand how it is that you can do certain things. Mm -hmm. Stakeholder management, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and everything that goes along with it. Nice talk, nice even to listen to. How does the Red Cross ensure that the partnership they have with the counties, because this is the level of that conversation, mm. going forward, is something that is continuous and continues to grow? Mm. Because it isn't a one-off when we have an emergency such as this one. No. But the very things you say, anticipatory response, mm. ensuring that what has happened does not is not repeated in the future. Mm -hmm. No, no, thanks for that. And uh, one of the things maybe I will start by saying is that uh, for us, uh, our relationship with, with the county is, um, is, is, is something that is, shall I say, it is set in the sense that we are not going anywhere because mm. the Kenya Red Cross is uh, enacted through an act of parliament to be auxiliary to the national and county government. So we have that relationship already, even in law. And so for us, ours is a complementary function uh, to complement uh, government, especially in terms of disaster relief. So we work with all the counties. We have our branches also in 47 counties, and that is the kind of relationship we have. Uh, we also sit and even co-chair some of the structures uh, in terms of disaster risk management. One of the things that we are actually supporting and working with county governments to assure, uh, shall I say, sustainability of uh, 
the disaster management response in the country mm. is supporting uh, development for example of policies uh, and, and bills and frameworks to support that whole uh, disaster framework and especially the coordination function. So we have counties where we have supported them to actually pass their disaster uh, management policies. Uh, unfortunately, of course, we still have the national one which is still pending uh, since almost 15 years ago. Uh, and that is one of the things we are hoping uh, that uh, our patron can help us <laughs> to push this so that... Um, there is uh, some some kind of conclusion. We know even there are countries that and borrowed, a a, and borrowed an, and that an framework entity and, that deals and, with the disaster response. Exactly, exactly. So this this is a big issue mm. and could help us solve a lot of our actually of our uh, coordination issues. So I think for me, uh, this is what I would say in terms of yes, how are we helping to sustain? But um, in terms of uh, and working with, with counties to change some of this issue. And I want to give an example of uh, Kitui County, uh, where uh, we worked with uh, Kitui County on this issue about uh, the food insecurity to say growing maize in Kitui uh, County may not be sustainable because mm. we know of the rain pattern. And we worked together with them with the support of uh, one of our external partners to uh, start growing dengue. Mm -hmm. And the, it was actually being called the Dengu Revolution and um, uh, Honorable um, Charity Ngilu, uh, you know, really took up that initiative. And we actually ended up with farmers really having a lot of bumper harvest. The whole idea behind that was also that, yes, they would have Dengu for local consumption, but it could also be uh, for economic sense. Mm. That this is an opportunity to now even start to sell even to the other counties. So I think there are examples of uh, how we can change some of these um, uh, situations for, for, for longer term, but it requires, you know, a real investment. And I think this is where sometimes I find we have a challenge because when we calculate how much it will cost for the, for the real investment, then maybe we get scared with the figures and say, oh, maybe this is too much money. So we wait until the emergency happens, we respond, but we don't know actually. Mm. And uh, for the Red Cross movement, we have been able to also, and I think globally the humanitarian sector, to calculate to show that you, in the end, you actually end up spending more on response than, than, you'd, have spent than you'd have spent on putting some of these long-term issues. Today expense. we are talking about drought. The amount of money that's going into food distribution is huge because mm. one food prices are high so today for the same amount uh, you know of food that we would have bought let's say with one million we are getting 50 percent yeah then there's the logistical cost taking food let's say from nairobi here to garissa mm. or to mandera by truck by road the personnel that have to support in the food distribution and that's why we are also encouraging and saying we also have to to change our response systems also to uh, take on board, uh, you can say, technology and systems that will reduce and increase our efficiency and effectiveness. So we are actually encouraging to do more of cash mm. where markets are available because it's about, we use M-Pesa, load it here in Nairobi, Send Already the, the registration has been done, mm. uh, people's mobile numbers have been taken, and you send the money and they all receive their money on an instant. They can go to the shop, to the market, buy what they need. They have the choice. You don't have, you know, uh, any issues in terms of, uh, you reduce on your logistical, logistical and, and costs and also in terms of uh, accountability. Uh, you know, when you have so many people in between, so many things also can happen. So that gives you a very good uh, system to reach people quickly, mm. but also to give them choice and dignity because uh, queuing and uh, giving people sacks of maize and beans is something I think we need to stop. We'll talk about that after we take this break. It's 25 minutes to nine. This is Kenya's biggest conversation. Dr. Asha Mohammed is a secretary general of the Kenya Red Cross Society. She's here with us. We're talking about mitigating hunger and the worsening drought in Kenya. How many people are in dire need of food today? 4.35 million Kenyans in almost more than half of the geographical landmass of the Republic of Kenya are hungry. Now, we don't even know whether this number is the real number uh, because as we are seeing, well, Figures are just bandied left, right, and center.
let's just say that more than 4 million Kenyans are hungry today and they need emergency support today. And beyond that, then we also need to see how do we make sure that we, go and we don't get to such a situation in the future. That's what we're discussing. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. We continue the conversation about Balanjana Ukame with Shirika Lamsalaba Mwekundu. The Secretary General, Dr. Asha Mohammed, is here with us. We're talking about, you know, what could have been done, what ought to be done now, and what then we should also be thinking about. Sometimes when you look at the things that happen around the drought cycles, like you've said, last year, for example, in the middle of uh, COVID, the government from the highest level in the country, the president, said, we are abandoning this thing of flagging off food from Nairobi and waiting for it to go to the people. We shall go this technology way. He rolled out that thing that he just talked about. M-Pesa, support local markets, support local economies, so that then it's not just about sending food, but it's also supporting the local economies. We are back to that thing. It's like it's a business that people benefit from. We talk about, okay, so uh, we need to start mobilizing so that then we can help feed the people. And you sit back and you look at the effort being made and being taken to address this by government agencies and then you look at by uh, institutions such as yourself you and the other ngos and you see it's like the ngos are carrying the burden of feeding the people it sounds like a business to me any that's not my question so <laughs> now that we are where we are and we're looking at the very many people who are in dire need of support today a couple of years back the kenya red cross partnered with the business community partnered with the media and he launched Kenyans for Kenya. Is it about time that we had a similar initiative, a countrywide initiative that sensitizes everybody to the plight of more than 4 million Kenyans? Uh, yes, and I, I, I just want to say that actually uh, it's not like this has not been happening uh, because there are a lot of um, uh, initiatives. Uh, we have uh, what is called the Pamoja Initiative, of which we are also part of with the private sector mm. uh, that has been uh, ongoing. Um, as Kenya Red Cross as well, we have been um, sensitizing and mobilizing and even getting support uh, from partners. Uh, but yes, uh, maybe it, w it has not been done in the same uh, scale and the same uh, coordinated way through the, uh, you know, almost, you can say, the kind of platform that we had for uh, Kenyans for Kenya. And uh, uh, this is something I think we, we need to really uh, look at. Uh, but of course, before we also go in that direction, I think for me, it's also about uh, looking at what is already available. Uh, both, of course, with, you know, first of all, with government, uh, with the other uh, major stakeholders, uh, uh, donors, uh, organizations like ourselves, and through a coordinated uh, mechanism to then be very careful about um, who is working where and what are they doing, because sometimes we, it feels like, yes, we, th there is some resource, but also the coordination of how we are doing it to avoid also duplication. Yeah. Uh, I will tell you, I, I have a struggle uh, because uh, as Kenya Red Cross, uh, we try to really look at where some of these pockets are. And some of these pockets are not in some of the counties that maybe are seen saw. as, you know, the, the ones in the alarm. Mm. So everyone who wants to give, wants to give to those counties. And these other counties are then sort of left behind. And uh, uh, this is how then we end up with the surprises that we end up with because uh, nobody has been really serving and looking at what is going on there. And I keep using this analogy that I, 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 I like of that we are busy removing people from the swimming pool but we are not stopping others from falling into the swimming pool and that yeah. is why the number is increasing mm. because we have to stop others from getting here so there has to be a two-pronged approach we can't all uh, just only look at yes these are the ones today that need immediate yes they do but at the same time what do we need to do to stop others from getting there because if not uh, I don't want to be a pessimist, but by December, we could easily be talking about 5 million Kenyans needing assistance if we don't don't go in that way. Because now, yes, we will put a lot of effort on the ones that uh, need 
currently uh, very dire assistance and we must because we must save lives but at the same time we need to start looking at how to prevent the others and this is not just for government or for organizations like like mine but also even with our partners because also donors are being uh, also very rigid about where they want their support to go. Mm. Uh, some have even very, you know, earmarking and saying, okay, we can only s so support you for Turkana. Mm. Yeah? They're prescriptive. Exactly. Mm. We, cannot, uh, we cannot go to Kilifi, for example. We mm. can only do Turkana. And even in Turkana, we can only do food or we can only do cash. As opposed to saying, okay, let's put... Here is a kitty. Let's exactly. Then to the let's kitty. look together. All these partners who are in Turkana, or all these partners who want to be in the drought, where are the needs and what are the needs? And then we can uh, try to. So that's a bit of a challenge. So you'll have some counties that, in my view, could be oversubscribed. Mm. Although in the situation we are in, there's no way of saying it's actually oversubscription. But if you comparative to other counties, yeah. then you feel that there are counties that. Uh, will be will be forgotten and we will get many more Some will be we'll get out. more surprises coming before city you come in i just yeah. want to throw in a question here there is now administrative coordination of donor assistance in the country yes and uh, ngos working in the country under the office of the deputy president yes is that helping it is helping very much and like i said even yesterday i was in one of the meetings and today we are going back where you know we are all discussing together government is saying we have so much we have so much food these are the counties that are affected private sector is saying we are bringing in so much we will be able to, red cross is saying we will we have this and for us one of the biggest offers we have is that we are on the ground like you said we have the experience we have the volunteers we are a grassroots organization even in terms of human resource to help with this distribution to help with the targeting and ensure that the right people who actually need to be given the food need to be given because uh, as much as everybody may need uh, this food at this point in time uh, with the resourcing we have we also have to be careful that we look at the ones that are most vulnerable first and ensure that they don't sleep further mm. um, thank you you know the i'm listening to what you're saying and i'm comparing it with what the little i know about the red cross and your job is infinitely complicated in this sense here you are working with partners for the same goal and then there's this human element where people will want to help you on their terms not on the terms of what is actually needed to be done because there may be agencies there may be partners but they also have jobs to protect they have things to do etc etc then there are the people who receive help and there's this psychological condition i actually turn of phrase conditioning people get used to being helped so they become dependent mm. Now, not the people who actually receive the help, but the people who oversee the lives of these people are in that position. So when they have a problem, they think Red Cross. And not necessarily the solutions that may be at hand that they could actually use over a period of time. Good times, they sit back instead of using it to do what they could do, knowing if there's a problem, they'll go to Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> how do you balance this? Let me explain why I'm thinking. I'm mm -hmm. thinking, I'm looking at... When you say there's no rainfall in this country, there are still parts of the country that do get rainfall. Get yes. Mm -hmm. When you say there are people who can't grow certain crops, Calro has told us, my friend, with their research, you just need to find out what can grow where and what seeds you need to use. Now, we talk about international trade, and if I look at the thinking behind it, it's specialization. This country is good at doing this, and they have it. Yeah. Ukraine is good at having, they have grain. Russia has gas. Now, we see it happening. They pipe their gas to Europe. Europe. Now, mm. why can't we do the same thing? Because agriculturally, we know which area produces mm. what. Mm. Why don't we encourage inter-county trade so that some of these things that we keep talking about are balanced out? How do you explain a situation where you have a county where at some point people were pouring out milk because they did not know what to do with it? And yet there were others at the very same time. Currently, it's happening. Yes. Uh, farmers in Nyandaro are throwing away cabbages, mm. trying to feed mm. their dogs. Yeah. You want to make dogs vegetarians? Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I think this is. Uh, I, I don't have the answer, but I think I'm in the same situation you're in because, uh, for sure, uh, the, something can be done because, like you said, countries are trading. Even Kenya, 
we are exporting tea, we are exporting uh, coffee, we are exporting flowers, we are exporting even vegetables. The, the, the same uh, produce that we are saying, you know, is in bounty in some counties. Uh, so the question is, uh, how do we create that system to ensure that actually, you know, food can move from one area to the other? Even some of these uh, semi-arid and semi-arid uh, areas, they are, they are things, they are also... Uh, it's not that they don't have anything uh, completely. I mean, Turkana, there's plenty of fish. Every time I go to Turkana, I come back with a lot of fish, dried fish, and I mean, it's and it's very tasty fish. Is is that also something that can be also traded with another county that mm -hmm. has something else? And I think the logistics of how that happens. And actually, currently, I will say one of the things that uh, you know uh, government has taken up is 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 this issue, and we are uh, in it trying to see. How do we then work with these counties where there is surplus uh, to ensure that, you know, this food can be taken to, to the different um, counties that don't have? So I think this is something that uh, needs to be looked into and the structure and systems that are needed to ensure this trading actually happens. I give you a simple example. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, uh, we supported... Uh, some pilot project mm. in uh, Nairobi, in Mukuru, and we did a similar one also in um, in, 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 in Mombasa. Uh, it's about the people in the village there or that settlement mm. trading within themselves. Because mm -hmm. now we had people who had lost their jobs. Yeah. Uh, they did not have uh, cash to buy food. Yet within this uh, village... You had somebody who had a shop who was selling something. Mm. There was somebody who had his water kiosk. You had a lady here who could make samosas. You had another one who could plait hair, mm -hmm. who was a hairdresser. And it was amazing to see how that actually, you know, it's the, the, the butter trade system. That I come to you, I, I, sell, I sell you my samosa and you give me bread from your shop. Yeah. I come and plait your hair, you give me, uh, you know, a jerrican of water. And there was a, an agreement and a system, uh, you know, we're calling it sarafu system, where you even agree on what is the value of that sarafu. Mm. And people survived with that. And they were very happy with it. The, of course, that was just a pilot because the challenge also was that how would you extend it beyond this but, community? But it proved the concept. Yes, absolutely. That it can be done. You know what is actually interesting? Mm. Even in the so-called developed world, there has been similar discussions and proving of concept with clothes. Yes. Do you necessarily need to buy new clothes? Do you necessarily need to dispose of old clothes? What do you do? Can you actually barter? Mm -hmm. And when I say it is something that has, it's been done, yeah. uh, it's not a thinking that it's, it, it's as old as time and it's still as relevant as time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's value exchanging value. Yeah. Now, because of the far-flung reach that um, the Red Cross has, did you take this particular pilot to perhaps another area and see how it worked? Actually, we started with Nairobi. Yes. And then because of what we saw you know, going on in Nairobi, yes. then we took another informal settlement in Mombasa. Yes. And so the idea Which was, was in, um, in um, uh, what is it called, uh, in Chuda. There is some, there's a... Kachonjo? Yes. Mm. So, uh, the, the, the question then is, mm. how do you scale that up uh, to other areas? Uh, it would require, of course, an, you know, extending and looking at the bigger system. Because, for example, let me, the, the shop in, in the area that um, is selling bread, the shopkeeper is getting bread from a supplier who is maybe here in um, Mombasa Road, yes. industrial area. The supplier is not able to trade with, with the, the sarafu. same sarafu yeah. with the shopkeeper. Because then now it ends at that so point. So at the end, to exactly. trade externally, you need the cash. Exactly. So now or, that is where... Or, or an intermediary. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Or an intermediary. Yeah. That's true. Yes. So that is where now, of course, uh, those were some of the, you can say, the, the challenges of seeing how it to, to take it to scale. But I'm sure if we sat together even with some of these people, and especially during this kind of uh, times, mm. I want to believe that 
even if we put all the systems in place. Uh, unfortunately, because of climate change and other factors, we know some of these issues may recur. But what we are saying is that even if they recur, uh, people should not be found in the same place where they are found. For example, drought will happen. For yep, sure. It will. It will happen. Yep. And this time it is happening even within shorter periods uh, of time. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And yes. Exactly. But if we are able to support communities to be more resilient, to look at you know alternative uh, livelihoods, I'll tell you, even in Turkana, as bad as it is, I have been there several times. When you talk to the people on the ground, they'll say, yes, today we need food and we need water. But what is keeping them most awake is their livelihood. Yep. Yes. Because they also don't want you to come there every day True. to give them food and water and sort of bring down their dignity and make them feel like that they are very helpless. Mm. They are looking at livelihoods. And that is something, you know, we really need to look at critically to ensure that people can be but able Dr. to... Dr. Mohammed, this conversation yes. is to move beyond that. Yeah. Mm. It, it, I mean, everybody agrees mm. that we need to have long-term, medium to long-term. Yeah. Even during that time for Kenyans for Kenya, your predecessors of the Red Cross were also saying the same thing. Yeah. People who are contributing for Kenyans for Kenya were saying we are not only feeding for today, we are also we seeing for the what longer term. projects can be initiated. Yeah. They didn't get support. Yeah. Some of them did not sustain. So... Yeah. As you go back but, to that meeting but, but, with but the I deputy think, president's I think also, office, um, how not, high not be, is this? As a, as, <laughs> not as a point to, not to be defensive about uh, the, the 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 Red Cross, mm. but I think the, the, there was also uh, some point of also not uh, maybe understanding and also uh, supporting the ideas to take them to where they needed to go, mm. because a lot of uh, those uh, interventions were proof of concept, yep. so to speak. Yep. Yeah. And so it could work, some worked, and today some are still working, others didn't work for many reasons. And so what were some of those reasons? So the question of how then we take some of those lessons. The lessons and then, and then scale. Continue. Exactly. And, yeah. and yeah. there was this feeling mm -hmm. of, uh, because we said we will do mid to long term and there was a project being done, that project uh, should have gone on and should have been sustained. Yeah. And right Today now, they're to still called Red Cross projects, yep. even the, where they're working. And we are saying, no, we already handed over. Some we handed over to county governments. Mm. So what did the county governments do? Dr. Your achievement is greater than you realize. I'll tell you this. Thank you very much. Mm. It's greater than you realize. <laughs> mm. What you've done, you've begun a process of behavior change intervention. Absolutely. If people's minds change over time, yeah. these things that you're talking about, yeah. when something works, it means they've accepted it. Exactly. And it probably means they were ready to accept it. Yeah. So it's a question of now finding ways of escalating. It's it. moving to the next. Yes, it is. Exactly. Take it to that you know that table that you're sitting no no absolutely the deputy president and, and unfortunately sometimes <laughs> yeah <where> it belongs. <laughs> no and unfortunately uh, i think as human beings sometimes it's almost like we need to be taken to a point where uh, we just then have to accept some yeah. things because today i think where we are with this drought situation even these communities as you visit them uh, you can see clearly they're like we we want to do we want Mind to do shifts. something about this situation Mind we want shifts. to change yeah. so maybe this is also the, the right time it's to fortuitous. exactly that's true. yeah thank you dr asha mohammed thank you very much for joining us thank you very much for having me really dr mohammed is the secretary general of the kenya red cross society we're talking about the drought situation in the country we all have a role to play to make sure that 4 million kenyans do not continue being in the situation they are in